Hello, everybody, and welcome to day eight of the Mill Valley Film Festival. My name is Osanachi Iba, and I am the manager of the Mind the Gap program. Mind the Gap is Mill Valley's equity and inclusion initiative that champions filmmaking by women, uh, people of color, non-binary people, and other marginalized group. Uh, this year in the festival, 53% of the films were directed by women. So that's a nice thing. So tonight you will be watching the film, Our Father the Devil, written and directed by Ellie Fumbi, who is uh, the recipient of this year's 2022 Mind the Gap Creation Prize. So the Creation Prize, uh, which is generously funded by longtime Mind the Gap partner, Christine Schantz, is an, a $10,000 unrestricted grant that goes to a first or second time female filmmaker with a documentary or narrative feature film in the festival. And it recognizes uh, creativity of vision and exceptional use of the film medium. So uh, this year, 11 films were eligible. Three were nominated, um, Our Father the Devil by Ellie Fumbi. Uh, Nikiatu Jusu for Nanny and Marissa Maltz for The Unknown Country. And uh, obviously Ellie was selected. Uh, a fun fact is that Nikiatu Jusu, who is the recipient of the Mill Valley Film Festival uh, Debut Feature Award and Ellie Fumbi, and um, Chinoya Chuku, who was the recipient of the Mind the Gap Award for her feature tale, are all very good friends. Mm -hmm. So it's exciting that they all got to come to the festival. And uh, <laughs> um, but here to uh, present Ellie with her award is Lauren McBride, who is the producer of the feature film Sella and the Spades, the former director of artist program at SF Film, and uh, she's also supporting the creation of a film center in Oakland, so. Thanks, Osnachi. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm really honored to be here tonight to present Ellie with this year's creation prize for her film, Our Father the Devil. So as Osanachi mentioned, this prize celebrates exciting new voices uh, who demonstrate a creativity of vision and a mastery of the medium. And Ellie brilliantly brought her vision to this debut film, which you'll see shortly. Um, through her brilliant writing and direction, her film invites us to move past the platitudes and cliches of trauma and forgiveness and redemption and it pulls us into the painful and beautiful complexity of the human experience. Ellie deftly uses the tools of cinema to give us silences that deafen. She creates claustrophobic frames that manage to distance. And she created a thriller that moved me to tears. This film succeeds not just because of Ellie's incredible talents and her singular vision, but because of the collaborative nature she brought to her process. She worked with many of the same collaborators she's worked with on previous shorts and projects, and she brought her experience as an actor to create space for her actors to explore and bring their strongest performances. As a result, and as you will see shortly, she created a film that triumphs. And so with that, I'd like to bring Ellie up to officially accept her award. Um, and in the tradition of Mind the Gap, instead of a traditional thank you speech, Ellie's gonna share with us um, something that inspires her. Congratulations, Ellie. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Can you hear you? Thank you, can you hold it? <laughs> Can't hold the flowers and read the poem at the same time. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna read for you uh, a poem called Choices by Nikki Giovanni. If I can't do what I want to do, then my job is to not do what I don't want to do. It's not the same thing, but it's the best I can do. If I can't have 
what I want, then my job is to want what I've got and be satisfied that at least there is something more to want. Since I can't go where I need to go, then I must go where the signs point. Though always understanding, parallel movement isn't lateral. When I can't express what I really feel, I practice feeling what I can express. And none of it is equal, I know. But that's why mankind, alone among the animals, learns to cry. Thank you. I chose this piece because it reminded me of when I was researching child soldiers. And the first thing that came to mind was this idea of choice. The choices we make in our lives and how those choices impact the course of our lives. And the biggest tragedy in most of the, the story of child soldiers is that most of these children don't have a choice. A lot of the decisions they make are out of survival. And I became really grateful that I didn't have to live that way, that I never had to make some of the choices that these children make. And I think this poem, um, in almost a very beautiful way, reminded me that even in the darkest places, even with coming from the darkest and most uh, oppressive circumstances, horrific circumstances, we can still choose to focus on whatever joy we have in our lives. We can still choose to appreciate the good things. And with that, I hope you enjoy the film. Thank you. Congratulations, Thank Ellie. You. Um, can you talk to us about uh, what inspired this film and, and where it came from? So many things. I feel like a lot of my inspiration comes from things that I'm exposed to. And my dad uh, worked for the UN, and he was in Rwanda after the genocide. And I'm always interested in what he's doing and what's happening in his world. And through his colleague, I was able to um, talk to some survivors of the genocide. And it got me thinking a lot about child soldiers and how violence is perpetrated, <clears throat> how in innocent people end up perpetrating violence. And I wanted to kind of explore that in a way that I didn't think I, I didn't feel that I'd seen it explored in, on screen before. And um, just became kind of obsessed with, with that and, and the challenges of even telling that story because of the fact that most of these children didn't know what they were really doing. Um, and sometimes it's out of um, survival. And so, yeah, I, I wanted to tell the, this story from a woman's perspective. And I wanted to, yeah, to just challenge myself to find some truth in there that could be compelling, yeah. Um, Marie is a very interesting character. <laughs> um, I love to watch how characters are introduced. Mm. And in this piece, you introduce both Marie and uh, Father Patrick in very interesting ways. Marie is, we're, we're not seeing her, we're seeing her reflection on glass and it's distorted and she's on the outside looking in. Mm -hmm. um, and then with Father Patrick, he is, we don't, we hear his voice, we see his body moving through a space and everybody's watching him, but we don't, we don't get that close to him. In fact, the first time that we really understand anything significant about him is when we see Marie's reaction, where she gets the nosebleed and she faints. Can you talk about um, that, those character introductions um, and, and why you chose to introduce them in that way? Such a good question. Um, I feel like both, I, I've always felt when I was writing the, 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 the script that Marie and Father Patrick are the flip sides of the same coin and that they're both hiding in some way. And, and when we meet them, we can't really see them directly, like because there's this double side to them um, and they're both carrying this massive secret. So it was clear to me at least that I had to find another way to, to introduce the audience to them. And I love the idea of this reflection because it already introduces the double and, 
And also it, it, it allowed me to do, I, I'm always trying to do multiple things in a shot. So it, it introduces this duality within Marie, but it also introduces um, the, the, oh, <laughs> hi. <laughs> um, I can talk in the dark, it's fine. Um, it also introduces uh, something that you don't realize until later on, which is the, the, that she is completely shut down as a woman. Um, and so for me, it was really important to kind of give that clue early on. And for Father Patrick, it was sort of uh, a combination of like, well, what she's, because I really think we're in her perspective in the beginning. And it's what triggers her to believe that it's him, it's his voice. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like the audience could focus on his voice by not seeing his face. But also, when you, you don't really know who this person is, introducing the mystery of the character. So those were the things that I was thinking about. You withheld a lot of information <laughs> from the audience throughout the film. There was a point where, when I was watching it, I was like, I don't know if, <laughs> she has the right person because he just so Good. vehemently denies that it's him. That's so intriguing. Can you talk about your decision to do that? Um, I make films for myself first. So I'm like, what would I want to see? Or what? Thrillers are my favorite genre. I just want to put that out there. And I always feel like people give too much away. Mm. And I like the idea of the audience really wondering whether she's right, you know, because you know that she's disturbed in some way. And it's like, is she really, is she just projecting this on this man or is it really him? That just felt juicy to me. So I went with it. Um, can, can you talk about the connection between um, so when Marie, she is like initiating Father Patrick and yeah. you intercut that, it's a montage of her initiating him and cooking. Mm -hmm. And so can you talk about the connection between the two of those, if indeed they are connected? Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's funny that I chose for her to be a chef because for me, there's this idea of her working with weapons, but also her nurturing and feeding people. So I, I like the contrast between her, you know, <laughs> feeding people and also, again, it's, it's about the two sides, right? So it's, you know, so for me that felt really dynamic. The fact that she goes back to the cabin to torture this man and then goes to work to, to do good. <laughs> I'm twisted, clearly. <laughs> um, I felt good. So I was like, let's go with it. <laughs> Um, so you're exploring an incredibly challenging mm. uh, subject matter, but with Marie, you never uh, you never idealize her and you yeah. never condemn her. Yeah. And similarly, with Father Patrick, you never condemn him either. Yeah. You are able to reveal the humanity in both of these people. So I'm just wondering about your own ethos or your artistic ideology. Like what allows you as a creator to have that uh, morally sophisticated approach to creating your characters? Thank you. Um, I, I think it has a lot to do with who I am as a person. I think also just my background as an actor and having to, when you're an actor and you're playing a part, even when you're playing a villain, you can't look at it as this is a villain. You have to justify, you have to find the humanity in that character. And so I, I, that was my job writing these characters. I had to find the humanity in all of them. And so I think it's, for me, it's much closer to life that no one's ever, there's it's life is great you know and so I really wanted to to show all those different sides and I mean I I you know it, I wrote it on the page and I didn't know if it was going to happen but I think I knew casting these these actors that something would happen um and that we would get closer to the truth by having it be more nuanced um and not looking for easy answers, which I think is very tempting when you're writing something like this. You just wanna like put everything in a box and say, no, it's this, it's that. Actually, I discovered early on that I, I was, that, that I had to allow myself to discover it pe like bit by bit. And, and it wasn't until I started working with the actors really that 
even the ending, we, we talked about this briefly. For a very long time, I did not know how this film was gonna end. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> they, they're in this, <laughs> I don't know how, like, what do we do? And it was through, I know, <laughs> I was in trouble. <laughs> and it was through workshopping it with the cast that the ending came to us. Yeah. Can you talk more about working with the actors? Because yeah. they're, these are dynamic performances mm -hmm. and they are going to some really challenging places. So as a director, how do you work with them um, to take them to those places? And then since you have experience as an actor, do you, uh, do you rely on that at all? Only in the sense that I trust my instincts, but but every actor works very differently, so I never assume that whatever works for me is gonna work for them. And Suleiman and Babitita were, were very different actors. Like, they needed very different things. But I will say the pandemic was a blessing because we had so much time. We were initially supposed to shoot this in 2020, and then with the extra year, um, a lot of backstory work. We spent so much time in backstory, like, I, they were both sick of me. <laughs> they really were. Um, but I was like, but this is gonna pay off because it, there's, there's things that once you've figured out like really the details of like how, they, how, how she was inducted in this group, her relationship with him when she was a child, like all of that stuff for me was so important that then the scenes in the present, there's, it, there's nothing to do. The history ha is there. Um, and so that was one way that we really dug deep was going into the backstory of each character, but also just, you know, um, looking at the scenes, like what's happening moment to moment and really tracking the arcs of both characters. Can you talk about uh, balancing the the trauma and the revenge with this romantic element too? Mm. Um, and it was interesting when I was watching the film because, you know, it's Arnaud. He's he's very attracted to uh, Marie and she seems to be very attracted to him. But there's something in her that won't let her go there. Mm -hmm. And then it was that scene in the bar um, and then afterwards when they were in the alleyway where it's like, oh, there's a there's a guilt. There's a shame that she has that doesn't let her go all the way there with him. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Honestly, that that's backstory work. I didn't even plan for it to happen like that. I just... Mm -hmm. I think the way the, the, the scene is written, obviously she is denying herself the pleasure mm -hmm. of f falling, you know? Um, and I, I think that's the only thing that we talked about was that she wants very much to let go and to be able to have this romance, but there's a part of her that doesn't feel she deserves to. Mm -hmm. Or at least it's, I mean, also we talked about how she hadn't been touched by a man in a very long time. So there's that barrier too. Um, but a lot of it was, wasn't really even planned. It was just in the DNA of that character, mm -hmm. given her, her history and her, her backstory. And so then you were in the screenwriting level, how did you balance all of those elements and all these themes that you're exploring? The only way I can explain it is, it, it's, is that I don't write from a, an intellectual place, I'm literally playing those parts when I'm writing them. So it's purely emotional and I'm just feeling what I think the, the, the character's feeling. And then I, you know, and once I hand that off to an actor, it's like they're gonna take in whatever they're feeling. And I think Babatita took the script and elevated it to another level. I, I can't take credit for that because she added so much more to what was on the page. Like she filled in those emotions in a way that I, I didn't even imagine was possible, to be honest with you. It was just sort of like, I hope it kind of goes this way, but I didn't really know, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and she brought that in and I just trusted her to do that. Sort of going back to, you know, working very closely with the actors, mm -hmm. when you're, sh like those scenes in the cabin were very, very intense. Yeah. And so can, so can you talk about what it was like shooting those scenes and, and working with the actors. Like I, I imagine that it must have been yeah. emotionally exhausting for them. So how do you um, practice getting what you are looking for as an artist and as a filmmaker with also making sure that you're uh, creating a, 
a, a larger practice that's sustainable? That was tough because we shot all the cabin stuff first. Whoa. I know. <laughs> I know. I, when I told them that, they looked at me like I was crazy. I was like, I'm so sorry, but we have to do this first. I think um, it was rough. I'm not going to lie. It was really rough, but I fought for a couple of days of rehearsal so that they wouldn't go in cold. And fought tooth and nail for those rehearsal dates. And I'm so happy that it allowed them to kind of, because it was also the first time they were in the space. So I was like, if we're at least in the cabin, we did all of the rehearsals in the, in the cabin. Um, and it allowed them to kind of, at least for Marie, it allowed her to familiarize herself. And I think once they, they sort of under, like once she situated herself, she was good. She was like, oh, okay, this is, and I think the only scene we really spent a lot of time on was the ending, because again, I like, I was like, I, guys, I don't know how we're ending this movie. Um, I had written something, but we, it expanded in the rehearsal. And then, but all the torture stuff, all of, all of that stuff, I was like, this needs to be in the moment. Like, we can't really rehearse this. We only rehearsed uh, any kind of stunt stuff. Like when she was beating him, we had a stunt coordinator coordinator there to like show us how to do that but everything else was kind of like we're gonna discover this as we go yeah oh, it was very scary um towards the end of the film uh before she is going to kill mm -hmm. father patrick marie tells him that she's going to grant him one last wish why does she do that that's such a good question i wish he was here to answer that <laughs> Um, why do you think she does that? Um, I think she's trying to offer some little bit of humanity that she didn't get um, when she was dealing with her trauma. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's it. No, seriously, I, I really do. And I think this idea of like, you know, yeah, it's like a last right, you know, before like most, you know, executions, you get one last wish or last right, whatever. And I think it's, it's that, it's very much that. Um, yeah. And then as she's bathing Father Patrick, um, he, he tells Marie that it's never too late to turn back and do the right thing. And earlier in the film, in the home, with um, Jean, she tells you know Marie that everyone deserves second chances. Mm -hmm. So there's a really strong theme of redemption in this piece, which I think is just so refreshing because it's not an easy redemption. It's not a simple redemption. They really have to like walk through something very difficult in order to arrive to that place. So can you talk about why it was important to explore that in this piece? Yeah, because I I felt like. The whole time I was writing it, I wanted so much for Marie to just let go of this and vendetta. Mm -hmm. And I think I also had enough respect for her to understand why it wasn't easy for her to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I thought this is a woman who is actually unable to forgive this man because she's unable to forgive herself. And in, in order for her to get to that point where she can say, all right, enough is enough, she has to feel that she's worthy of having a second chance. Um, and that hit me so hard as I, you know, and so it sort of became important, not just for her, but also for Father Patrick. And this idea that, um, that I spoke about earlier when I read the poem, that even when you've done the most horrific things or when the most, you've had the most horrific experiences, there can still be beauty in your life. And I felt that in this day and age of like cancel culture and people doing one thing or two things or whatever, like you've done something in your past and suddenly you're you're thrown away. I felt that we, we needed a, a different message because we're all human, we all mess up. Obviously this is on a much bigger scale. What he did is absolutely monstrous, but um, does he not have the right to try to do better? I mean, is that not what we want when, I mean, is not the whole point of jail is rehabilitation? So I don't know. So I, I, I was asking myself all of these questions and wanting to explore that kind of in a way that I hadn't experienced in a film. Um, 
And in yeah. the end of the film, it's Nadia, you know, Marie's best friend, who shows her love, and that's the thing that disarms her, that gets her to call off her vendetta. Um, and she has this really beautiful, cathartic moment. I want to talk about why you chose to, you know, make it Nadia, and how beautiful that is that she says, I'm never going to leave you. Um, and then also that shot at the end where Marie lets go finally emotionally and she's just weeping in Nadia's arms and you have it in this beautiful shot where we see um, Father Patrick watching like them and bearing witness to them and mm -hmm. we can feel him being changed and he starts praying. I just threw a bunch of, of stuff at you. <laughs> but um, can you talk about why you chose to have it be Nadia that um, is able to break through to Marie and then just talk about the construction of that last shot and, and what that meant. Yeah, I, you know, ultimately I discovered through the, through the the writing that it really is the a story about the friendship between these two very different women, and I thought to myself that the cure for this kind of whatever Marie was going through, it, which because she didn't feel like she deserved to be loved, which is why she had such a hard time um, giving opening up to Arnaud, but that only someone with whom I think she, who, who showed her that unconditional love, that that would be what would heal her. And I think if she, if she knew that, that Nadia would understand and would be on her side, she would have told her all of this earlier in the film. But I think part of what she holds till the end is the secret because it's the shame, it's the fear. And in all the research I've done with uh, about child soldiers, it's it's really the shame that kills them. The suicide rate is so high among child soldiers. It's so, so high because it's so difficult to reintegrate into society or to believe that you deserve to reintegrate into society. And, and so for me, just that moment of her saying that felt so powerful. And I also love that it's the love between two women that ends up like kind of tying up a film and not it's not Arno, even though he's, yeah, it's not him. <laughs> we wanted it to be him, but we were like, it's not him. Let's, you know, um, yeah. But that that felt good to me, and and it felt like something very honest for this moment. And can you talk about so you know Father Patrick is watching? Yeah. Oh, the shot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and because, that prayer too. Well, for me, this is the moment he really becomes a priest, and so. I felt like we need to stay in that shot so that we can see how he's taking in the responsibility. He's seeing the effect that he had on this woman's life. And I think that you it's also the first time you really do sense that he's truly sorry. That, I mean, I think he's sorry before that, but I think this is, it all kind of comes together. And yeah, it just was, the only shot. I, I I also didn't want another shot. I I <laughs> I tr I'm 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 a minimalist uh, uh, visually, mm -hmm. and so it's like how can we tell the story in as few shots as possible? Mm -hmm. And that felt like it it felt right. It felt like you know um, a, a way to tie in all three of these the, the these relationships, the relationship between Nadia and Marie, and the relationship between Marie and Father Patrick, mm -hmm. in a sort of clean, simple way. And then the final shot, mm -hmm. uh, when we leave uh, Marie and Father Patrick, is very different from how we met them because yeah. they're finally, they're in this two shot standing together and they're you know looking out at this beautiful vista. Um, can you talk about that shot and can you talk about where these characters go from here? Yeah, I, I this is the, what was so hard is I'm like, I don't know where they go from here which is why I chose to have the, their backs to the camera. Mm -hmm. um, you could say they're looking on to a future, but are they? I don't know. I mean, they're still carrying the same scars. They're still carrying the same burden. They're still dealing with that. Um, I do think there's a bit of hope for both of them, but I personally did not know. And so that's why that shot felt like the right shot. It was a really beautiful shot. Thank you. Um, is there anything else that you would like to say or about about this film? 
Um, no, just just that this film was a miracle, you know, like most all films are miracles, but this this film was was really a miracle and I I I don't know if I'll ever have an experience like this again, but there was I've never had such a clear vision and just everyone thought I was crazy. I think I was crazy also, but there was so much you have to take such a leap of faith when you're going into production, shooting in another country during COVID with such limited resources. I, f I learned a lot about relying on the people around me and you know, I'm just, I'm grateful that, that the actors experience what they experience. Like we all learned something, we all grew from, from this film. And I, I feel like it's set a very high bar for, you know, for the next things to come. Well, I think we're all very excited to see Thank what you. you do next. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you guys for staying and for coming. I really appreciate it.